Hi everyone and welcome to AXA Coral Live. My name is Jamie and we're going to be doing a fab What is Coral lesson today. Now if you've been part of Coral Live before, um, you probably know that we are normally broadcasting from the Kamabi Research Station on the island of Curaçao in the Southern Caribbean. And it's a wonderful place for Coral Live. We're very close to the amazing reef. It's about 50, 100 meters offshore. And the research station is a home from home for countless scientists from around the world who come to study the amazing coral reef. And not only can they access it easily, and study it there, but they can also bring samples back to the labs, both the dry labs and the wet labs at Kamabi, and do some of their initial analysis of how the coral reef works and how it might be changing. Now, very sadly, but for obvious reasons, we can't be down in Curaçao for Coral Live this year. Amazingly, we are at the National Marine Aquarium in the UK, and we're at the Great Barrier Reef exhibit, and fantastic to be here. Now, the National Marine Aquarium is operated by the Ocean Conservation Trust, and they not only do this fab public engagement work, but are also looking at research in the seagrass to see how we can bring back this amazing underwater meadow seascape to, to the abundance which it once had. As you can see behind me, abundance is one of the things we'll be looking at today. We've got all these fish in this great barrier reef exhibit. And if you dive on the coral reef, one of the things that you first notice that abundance of different shapes and sizes. But what supports all of this how are 25% of all marine species supported? So today, what we're going to look at is what is coral. And we're going to do that through the incredible edible polyp activity. Now, before we start that, I'm just going to see where some of you are calling in from. So I can see that we have schools from the UK, Canada, USA, France, Spain, Poland, India, Zambia, and Italy. Fantastic to have you all with us. And some special shout outs to give. Uh, good morning um, from Union Point Academy in Ken Kentucky. Sorry there. Um, good morning to everyone at Union Point. Should we have a big shout out to David Leader Middle School in Canada. Fantastic to have you all with us. A big hello to STS. World School in the Punjab in India and also to Ellesmere Port Catholic High School uh, ready to learn all about coral well fantastic to have you with us uh, so just to break down this what is coral live lesson so it's really going to be sort of two main parts so what we have first off is we're going to be doing an activity we're going to be doing the incredible edible polyp activity and that's anatomy by way of biscuits and bananas. And then we are going to come into the Q&A. So I think we've got stacks of questions lined up. If you'd like to post a question during the live lesson, then please do use the live chat function just to the side of the screen here. Remembering that you do need to be logged into YouTube. So that's really an adult job. Um, so if you're uh, watching from home, then that is a parent, guardian, um, carer, or if you're at school, probably your teacher, logged into YouTube, posting those questions from you guys up there. Now, if you can't for any reason use YouTube, then please do use the sort of contact us button. That's a speech bubble at the bottom right-hand corner of the Encounter EDU website, encounteredu.com. So looking forward to all those questions. We're going to keep most of that um, to the end uh, and then um, but if there are some questions or clarification then pop them through and those will be fed through to me here so let's get started 
um, with the incredible edible pull-up activity. It's sort of amazing to think that 25% of all marine species are supported uh, by the coral reef. And there's such abundance in these places and it really puzzled uh, a fairly famous scientist, Charles Darwin, when he visited the Great Barrier Reef in the 1830s. How can there be so much life but the waters be so clear and clear waters are, are sort of a sign almost of sort of an ocean desert because they don't have the nutrients, they don't have the food in them. So really during this activity is, is about anatomy and, and hopefully it's, it's more fun way of doing anatomy and then drawing a picture um, and labeling it. But it is doing anatomy, but it's also trying to solve this problem. How is there so much life? in such clear parts of the ocean. And so for this activity, you're gonna need a few things. You're gonna need a banana. You can also use a marshmallow, a big, big marshmallow. Um, you're gonna need biscuits. Um, so a like this really, you're gonna need biscuits or cookies. I don't know if this is a biscuit or a cookie in the US, I'm gonna to have to find out about that. You're going to need uh, some jam, uh, which I do know is also called jelly in various parts of the world. Um, you're going to need uh, some nice sticky strawberry laces. Um, so sweeties a bit like this, candy, uh, some colored candy sugar, um, hundreds and thousands of sugar sprinkles, whatever you might call them. And we're going to look at the anatomy of the coral polyp. Now, the reef is made by a tiny wee, wee animal. I, I, I'm talking about um, the polyp, and I've mentioned it a couple of times. We'll find out more about this animal. It makes up this incredible structure. It's related to the jellyfish. It's part of a family of animals called Nidarian. It's related to jellyfish, which floats through the water with tentacles, a bit like this. Um, you might also, if you're a fan of Finding Nemo, also um, might have also come across a uh, sea anemone, which is a bit like a sort of jellyfish, stuck to the bottom of the ocean. Now, we have the coral polyps, so it's related to to both those, so it's got this body, first of all. So to represent the body, we're either using a marshmallow or we're using a section of banana. So the first thing to do is to get the body of your coral polyp. I'm just getting the bits off there and take a slice off it. It's a rather large polyp um, this time. So you've got the section of banana or marshmallow, and that is going to be the body of our coral polyp. Now, one of the things that you might know also is that it's stuck to the bottom. It's a structure stuck to the bottom of the ocean. And we're gonna use a biscuit to represent the bottom of the ocean. The science technical word that we use for that is substrate, and particularly a rocky substrate. So it's not found growing on top of coral, it's that sort of hard rock, and often the skeletons of old coral colonies. And we're gonna stick that piece of banana or uh, marshmallow, if we're using it, with a bit of jelly um, on there, jelly jam. Smush that on, that technical term, smush. And then we're going to put our coral polyp on there like that, okay? So that's our first step. So that's our coral polyp attached to the bottom of the ocean. Now there is one kind of coral species that moves around, the mushroom coral, 
for, for all the other ones they're stuck stuck in the same place and what we're going to do first of all is look at how the coral polyp feeds traditionally so in the same way maybe that a jellyfish or a sea anemone feeds and that's by having a mouth in the center here and having tentacles around the outside so do you use something like a toothpick or something else um, to make these holes so first of all a big hole in the middle oh dear slipping around i need to improve my smushing skills obviously uh, a mouth in the middle and then round the outside we're going to put some tentacles and the tentacles are what these cnidarians the jellyfish and anemones and uh, coral use to catch their prey. So these tentacles are going to be made out of the sugar lace or whatever it might be. Now, these reef growing corals um, typically have six tentacles or orders of six, multiples of six. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to put in six tentacles. Oh, I'm just going to do this down here. It's, it's a bit fiddly. So if you might be following along at the same time, so this is a chance. What we really want to see at this stage is a banana with a hole in the middle to represent the mouth and then multiple of six tentacles around the outside. Oop. So there's a bit of a rogue tentacle there. Uh, I'm just going to make another hole, put one more tentacle in. Or I should say two more, because I've got two more left. And then we should have something resembling, of course, very, very similar, anatomically correct. Here we go, coral polyp. And if I hold it up there, you might be able to see the tentacles there. So what we have is a soft-bodied animal with six tentacles, which it uses to catch the bigger amount of larvae or eggs or small creatures coming through the water. Now, remember, we started this off by talking about how Darwin was, was perplexed about um, how much abundance there was, how many thriving, how much thriving life there was in this part of the ocean when it was clear, when there weren't many nutrients around. And he couldn't, he couldn't work this out, he couldn't work this out. And what it sort of turned out to be was that the coral polyp had a sort of supercharge trick. It had algae growing inside its tissue. And I'm going to use the sugar sprinkles to represent those. Oh, crikey. Um, and so the coral polyp has algae growing inside it that gives it about 70 to 90% of its energy. And it does that through the process of photosynthesis, the algae photosynthesizes, and then passes those sugars, most of those sugars, over to the coral polyp. It's amazing. And so these structures made by the coral polyp are only possible because it's supercharged by the algae inside its tissue. And these algae are what give the coral polyp its color. Otherwise, it would be a sort of white see-through. Um, yeah, so you see these, these browns, these oranges, greens, yellows, reds. This is a sort of typical planty type color that we'd associate with algae. And this is what gives the coral reef its color or the coral its color. You might also find sort of purples or blues in terms of color of coral. Those are mainly from 
the sort of sunblock proteins that are used to protect very shallow coral from harmful UV rays. So what we have here is our coral polyp, tentacles to catch small animals and other particles at night, algae inside its tissue to generate the sugars during the day. But we've got one big problem here. We've got this soft tissue. And so it can be quite vulnerable, remember, remembering that the coral polyp, for the most part, except for the mushroom coral, can't move. And so what it does is it takes calcium carbonate, so that's the same mineral as chalk, limestone, marble, takes that from the water and creates these amazing structures. And not only for protection, but also to access more and more light, but it's almost like building, in some ways, uh, sort of solar panels underwater. And so to represent that, we are going to put a little bit more jam around the edge of my coral, and then take another biscuit, and then break that up and put it around the coral to represent the calcium carbonate structure and protection that the coral polyp creates for itself using calcium carbonate from the water column. So what we have here is we have the coral like this calcium carbonate cup and when the coral divides into it, it clones itself buds, it then goes and creates a structure, 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 and different species of coral will create different structures, everything from the elkhorn coral to the brain coral to the star corals, uh, to the bold corals, the plate coral, all these amazing different structures depending on the species. Now, having gone to all this trouble, and I hope you have to do post a photo um, with an adult support using the hashtag Coral Live with your incredible edible polyp. But my, I think I haven't quite had enough lunch yet, so I'm just gonna have a nibble of this for my lunch. Um, do have one too, and then we're gonna come on to all the questions that you've been sending us on the ground by here. Oh. Not as bad as I thought it was gonna be, no. It's pretty good. Mm. Bit of jam and jelly everywhere. Amazing. So, here we are. Amazing questions that have come through. So, from um, Union Point, and we've got some great, great questions um, looking at Curacao. Uh, so, we've got a couple there. The most abundant uh, coral in Curacao is a great question. I um, look forward to, to Christian giving us the definitive answer tomorrow, but certainly the most abundant that we've seen uh, are the star corals and the uh, brain corals out there. That's just in the sort of bay around um, the uh, Kamabi Research Station. And there's some, also some wonderful um, outcorn coral just along. So I'd say that the, those, those are the types of coral that we see most dominant uh, where we are um, at Kamabi, but really fantastic question. What is the average water temperature in November at the research lab in Curacao? Now, in the sort of tropical equatorial areas, what's really important to point out uh, when we talk about sea surface temperature, which we're talking about here, is that corals are, are, are quite fussy. Uh, they, they, they like things to be pretty stable. So what you find in these tropical waters is that the temperature is pretty stable throughout the year. So you may find some variation in, in the climate of these places in terms of sort of a little bit of temperature fluctuation, um, maybe more rainfall at certain times of the year, but the sea surface temperature is really only between about 27 and 29 degrees uh, throughout the year. So that stability is incredibly important uh, for the health of the coral animal, for the coral polyp. 
That's a really great question. It, it means that studying coral um, is, is, is quite pleasant, certainly more pleasant than getting into the waters in the Arctic, um, getting into the waters um, around Curacao. But yeah, so we're talking about coral polyps, typically sort of 23 to 29, probably is their the range around the world. But when we've got Curacao, it's about that 27, 28, 29 degrees um, Celsius. Um, I haven't got my sort of like mental arithmetic hat on to convert that instantly into Fahrenheit, but it may pop up on my screen. Uh, and if it does, I'll, I'll relay that to you guys. Um, uh, I've just been told that that 70, about sort of between about sort of 78, 78 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a great question here from Urchester School, which is fantastic, which is, uh, does coral need water to breathe? Um, and it's a really interesting one in, in, in so far is that it needs um, oxygen to respire um, so that you could call it breathing. It uses it as a membrane to, as a sort of to take oxygen from the water. Certainly, if you took it out of, it needs to be in sea water to survive um, for various reasons. But so I suppose you could say, yes, it does need water to breathe and it takes the, the oxygen dissolved in seawater and uses that for respiration. So, yes, coral needs water to breathe. Fantastic question. How are the corals you find in the Caribbean similar and different to deep ocean corals? that you find in colder waters. And that's from Luca um, at the American School in Bilbao. Luca, wonderful, wonderful question. I think, I think this, this, so just to everybody else watching, so what Luca's um, talking about is a difference between the corals that you sort of normally think when you see coral, when you think coral reef sort of tourist ads, sandy beaches, coral reef, from all the nature documentaries, that kind of thing, with the fact that only about 10% of all coral species on the planet are those types of coral species. There's a lot of species um, that we find in the deep ocean that don't have the algae inside them that um, survive and grow very slowly from particles um, in the air, uh, sorry, not in the water. And so what I'd say, the main difference between these colder, deeper corals and the shallow corals that are more noticeable or that you actually find on the uh, Great Barrier Reef and on the reef by Curacao is, is that really the presence of the sea sand the, the turbocharge, and then the, the, the speed at which they grow with the sea sand that algae inside their tissue. But on, on the flip side of that, in the deep ocean, you do find some incredibly old corals, so long-lived corals, sort of over 4,000 years old uh, in, in the deep ocean. So it's, 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 those are the main differences. Deeper, you don't, you're slower growing um, corals near the surface. You've got the Susanthelli inside the tissue, faster growing. Probably the deepest coral you're going to find, or some of the deeper corals you're going to find, which might have some sooth natalie, might use that, sort of get that energy from photosynthesis about 125 meters, possibly. And that's a species um, that um, one of the collaborators we work with, normally in Curacao, found on the Great Barrier Reef uh, a number of years ago. Okay, so how long does it take for a coral reef to form? And that's from um, Stefan in Poland. I mean, Stefan, it's a great question. I think, I think that you know, it depends what you call a reef. Um, typically, what you see uh, in terms of growth rates are between about half a centimetre to about 20 centimetres per year, depending on the species. So the sort of, normally, the sort of bigger, bulkier coral, the sort of bolder corals, stony corals, those grow slower. And the more branch-like corals, like the staghorn coral, um, grow faster, so towards the 20 centimetre a year mark. 
for a, a, a reef to, you know, to grow, recover, often people talk about a period of sort of 20 years plus. Um, so, and, and people talk about this uh, or have talked about this in terms of storm damage. So if a hurricane or a cyclone or whatever can come through and, and trashes um, a section of reef, 15, 20 years afterwards, it's starting to look like it, like it sort of, you know, sort of look like a reef again. Um, so, so that 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 would probably say, you know, 15, 20 years for a reef to grow back. In in terms of, you know, the fact that the reefs often sort of grow on top and top and top and top and top of each other, um, so you might say that a coral reef has taken many thousands of years um, to grow, depending on how depending on how you look at these things. So it's a really really interesting question. To think about so thank you stefan thanks so much for that question uh so we've got from um how does coral get its color and that's from mana uh primary in sussex so just to go over that again um by way of um chocolate sweets um you've got some color of chocolate sweets like these ones uh which are the color of the susan Thelly. Uh, so there's a plant-like colors, so the browns, the greens, the yellows, the reds, so on. And then you might get other ones uh, where you've got a more sort of bluey, bluey, purpley color. And those are normally the sort of sunblock proteins. Um, so that, that's where coral, coral is, is, is getting its color from. Um, some people are often surprised that coral aren't these sort of, you know, amazing, wacky sort of reds and purples and, you know, whatever on the roof. Very often... If you see that color on the reef in terms of a sort of static object uh, or animal, that's that's going to be a sponge um, rather than a coral. Um, so that's where coral get, gets its color from. Uh, Richard Taylor School would like to know: Is there any uh, coral um, in the UK? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the most famous uh, British reef system. Uh, is in the Hebrides. It's the Mingale um, Reef. I think that's spelled M-I-N-G-U-L-A-Y. And there's a great research team who used to be based out of Harriet Watt um, University up in Scotland who are studying that. Um, and the website I think you want to go to is lophelia.org, which is L-O-P-H-E-L-I-A.org. Um, so do have a look at that and find out about some of the deep water coral habitats um, that we um, have in the UK. No, really great question. So thank you very much um, for that. Uh, <laughs> can coral move its location? Uh, can coral grow back if some of it is snapped off? Really interesting uh, questions again. Uh, first question uh, was, it, can it move its location? So there's, yeah, there's, there's one species of coral, the mushroom coral, um, that can move around. Um, pretty well all the other ones are what we call sessile, so stuck in one place. Uh, and then let, let's think about um, some of the sort of issues around that. I think it's quite funny. So, so first of all, as we go back to our coral, so I've slightly munched um, our coral polyp here is that it's um, the single coral polyp settling on the bottom of the ocean and then grows into the coral colony by cloning itself, splitting the two, taking more calcium carbonate, chalky substance from the ocean, growing the structure, growing the structure, splitting in two, growing the structure, splitting in two, and that's um, how it grows. So um, can it... Can it move its location? No, but it grows out into its location. Um, can coral grow back if some are snapped off? Yes. And there's some, you know, some well-documented examples of, of course, of storm damage, bits of coral getting back onto the bottom of the ocean and then um, growing back from there. Bits of coral reseeding onto the ocean is also a technique used in coral restoration. Um, and so the, there are examples of bits of coral being planted back out onto the ocean. And in fact, we are going to be looking at some of that 
over the coming lessons. More in terms of Kamabi about helping corals grow back out using um, artificial sort of reef bits. But these are all really important areas of study if we are to look at supporting reefs to recover faster after something happens to them. So that might be a storm or that might be a bleaching event. And that's where the relationship between the polyp and the algae breaks down and can lead to coral dying. Uh, and that's caused by warming ocean. So all these events, whether it's that or other impacts, how can we support coral to recover past this? Wow. So um, Max at Oxford would like to know, can too much tourism damage the coral reefs? Uh, yes and no, Max. It's a really interesting question. And one that I would put back would be, what role um, can tourism play in coral reef conservation? Now, you're right insofar as we, we need to look at the amount or the pressure of tourism. Um, so it can be very light um, touch tourism, or it can be limited in terms of, of numbers and the way um, that it's operated. So I think the opportunity to do tourism well, so that's in a way that uh, has nature at its center, that has a very light footprint on the natural environment and is about uh, understanding and wonder uh, as well. That kind of tourism brings in really important, not just uh, dollars, pounds, whatever, into economies that make it worthwhile conserving these habitats and can, could also contribute to other initiatives. But it creates ambassadors in those who are able to see these natural wonders who can go off and further spread um, the message about conserving um, this incredible ecosystem. So it's, it's a really interesting um, piece about you know what type of tourism do we want, and also how how it can not be too elitist. Uh, we could we could sort of like you know make it incredibly incredibly expensive to 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 go and see the reef. So so how how how, how do we get that balance right and, and and open up access on an equitable basis as well as bringing in money to support the reef? How many species of fish live on the coral reef? Um, that's from Austin at Farnham Church of England School. Uh, how many species of fish? Um, it is calculated on the reefs around Curacao, there are 358 species of fish. Uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, there are about 1,600 species of fish and uh, I will give you a free trip to the coral reef if you can name all 80 species uh, of fish in this tank by the end uh, of this lesson. Um, go. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's about depending on where you are in the world, um, is, it, is, is the amount of fish, that is, different fish species that are supported um, by the reef. So about 350 in, in Curacao, about Directly on the reef is probably more like sort of 1,400 on the Great Barrier Reef, um, but, but, but it varies, but really great question. Uh, uh, which uh, species of shark are, are found around the reef in Curacao uh, and how are they similar and different? Uh, that's Telmo at the American School of Bilbao. Telmo, that's a really, really cool question, and we're going to come on to that on Wednesday. The fact of the matter is... Um, I don't know because we've never seen a shark um, in Curacao, uh, and, and sharks shark sightings are a rarity uh, because they've all been fished out. Where we are um, at Kamabi, there used to be a, a shark net, and the whole two pound of sharks would be almost sort of pressed up to this net. Um, just about 30, 40 years ago, but they've all been fished out, 
Um, and it's it's a you know it's it's a, it's quite a sad story that you know that now she, now jumping in the water and seeing a shark on a reef should be a normal thing. Um, and certainly the first time I, I, I jumped jumped over the side of a boat um, and went to see a reef, um, there, there there were sharks. But in terms of Curacao, um, pretty well all gone. But we've got a shark lesson just for you uh, on, on on Wednesday, and we'll talk more about the different types of shark. Um, both in, in Curaçao um, and, and across the world. Uh, um, from me from school, we've got what types of fish are on the coral reef? Uh, Lee from school, lots. Um, but I think that, uh, it's sim sorry, a simple question, but I think that if we, if we look and think about uh, some of the fish here, um, you've got your bigger uh, carnivorous sort of predators, um, so you've got, uh, I don't know whether you can see, probably not off the corner there, but you've got a Maori ras there. Um, we've got Samuel, who's a big grouper, um, over at the back um, down here. Um, so you've got these big carnivorous fish, including sharks. You've got herbivorous fish, you've got omnivores, you've got ones that sort of clean the reef. Um, you've got a whole, whole damsel fish, butterfly fish, grunts, sergeant majors, uh, triggerfish, unicorn fish. Um, I'm just going to say to uh, so many fish, I, I think come back on Thursday as a really good day for doing lots of different creatures because that's our food chains and food webs day uh, where we'll be doing far more about different creatures. Today is really about the coral animal itself and, the, and that kind of question. We'll come back on on, on um, Thursday. We've got more 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 of that. Um, oh, look, and we've got an eel. So we've got the eel. If I come back this way, I think move over this way. Um, we've got um, the Maori wrasse here, and the eel is just coming over the top of the, of the, uh, this come, okay. This come about a logo, apparently, just swimming off into the back there. Um, so just to give you just a couple, couple of the, the animals here. Um, amazing. Uh, <laughs> Stefan, um, with another really great question. Uh, what animals bond with the coral reef e ecosystem, especially? Stefan, uh, there's such diversity of, of animal um, on, on, on the coral reef. I'd say, uh, oh, look, and there's a lionfish. It's like a... Um, what animals bond? I don't know how to. I, I don't know whether um, just just for I know people behind the scenes uh, in Canterbury to you. Can we find out from Stefan sort of what he means? Stefan, what do you mean by bond? Um, I'd love to answer your question, but I just want a little bit more there. Um, can any of the fish be poisoned by the coral? That's um, Trimley uh, at, at St Martin, or, or Trimley St Martin. It might be your name. Um, so, uh, can a fish be poisoned by coral? Great question. I don't think so. Parrotfish eat coral. I think damselfish are a bit of a nibbler. Um, and no, not so, not so much. They do have in, in, in their stinging tentacles, they have got special stinging cells, which, um, have, um, toxins in them i know certainly for other types of cnidarians so that's anemones jellyfish etc the clan fish live in the anemones so also called anemone fish and they have a special mucus on 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 on, on over their bodies to protect them from the stings um from from the anemones um but i don't know of any examples of coral poisoning animals but really interesting question We've got another one. Can any of the fish be poisoned by the coral? Uh, so we've just done that one. What are the most common and the rarest corals? Common, probably the most common one that you sort of come across probably is sort of staghorny, staghorn type coral, um, probably across um, across the world's reefs. Um, but will vary from place to place. Uh, rarest corals, um, probably the rarest ones are the ones we don't know of or uh, deep down in the ocean. So there's thousands of deep water coral species um, and maybe one uh, that we haven't discovered yet. Um, <laughs> what happens to the coral if the water gets really cold? 
and that's from Mali from Bermuda. Now, if if it's a if it's a cold water um, like in coral, um, then of course no, nothing happens, uh, Mali. But Mali, if if you get um, uh, the colder waters, it's, it's basically outside of the operating temperature range. And, and so you, you will start to, to have some more, more mortality, some death um, of, of the coral there. One of the things I think about, interesting things about Bermudan coral is you don't get so much of the warmer bleaching um, so that you find on other reefs because that warm water only comes up um, for a little bit and then, and then recedes. So Bermuda um, tends, tends to be a bit more stable um, in terms of temperature and not having those warmer, warmer temperatures that are affecting other corals um, around the world. Uh, uh, Stefan, what animals love the ecosystem of coral to live? Um, there's several thousand, Stefan, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of animals um, that love the coral reef and, and, and call it and call it home. The single out one, um, I'd go for the uh, Christmas tree worm. Have a look at have a have a look for a Christmas tree worm online. It's just one example of a um, an animal that loves and bonds uh, with the coral reef. Uh, what is the least common place for coral to grow on land? Is he from Westington? Um, you don't get any coral on land. You don't really get any coral uh, in freshwater. Uh, you don't get any coral first of all. You don't uh, get it really on sandy, sandy bottoms, uh, sandy bottom of the sea. It likes hard, rocky bottoms, and it likes uh, nice, clear, warm water for tropical corals or deep water uh, for cold water corals. Um, would coral be able to survive and grow slowly if there was no algae inside? That's from first down. Yes, it would, and it does. Um, so I think I was talking about the coral reefs of Scotland. Those are cold water reefs with no algae and they grow slowly. Um, some coral um, species growing uh, for over 4,000 years. Um, so perhaps up to 5,000 years. So really, really long lived um, animals. Um, we hear about coral bleaching. Are there places and environments where coral are doing particularly well? The Red Sea seems to be coming out with quite a few success stories um, at, at the moment in terms of resistance to thermal bleaching, so heat-based bleaching. There's good examples in the Caribbean of, of uh, corals recovering um, after sort of many decades or several decades of, of disease, of overfishing, of all these, of these other threats um, to coral. So I think, yes, there are examples of coral recovering, and that gives us hope. It's not an excuse to let up on trying to conserve this amazing habitat, but it does give us hope um, that, that the coral reef can be conserved and preserved for future generations. So I think we've got one uh, last question we've got time for, and that's what's the best experience you've had on a coral reef? I think it's it's very hard to describe, but I'll, I'll try the first dive. To experience a coral reef for the first time in person, it, it's like entering a sort of Disney magic world. You can't believe that on this planet is a place of such movement, of color, of variety, of life, of, of just sheer sort of natural joy almost. And it's, if you've ever seen the sort of old version of, of Snow White with the butterflies and bambies and, you know, rabbits hopping about, it, it feels a bit like, bit, bit like that. And it feels almost unnatural that you, you've, you've gone through the surface of the ocean and into this other world. And that first dive um, for me is, 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 the best experience I've had to, to, to know that this existed uh, before knowing about the fragility, before knowing about coral bleaching, before knowing 
um, about all these things, to experience it with sort of un unfettered joy um, was, was, was the, the best experience. And, and still that, um, Ellie, who's a live producer, who's, who's sort of making sure everything working will know that when we're at Kamabi, there's a, there's a patch of elk or coral a couple of hundred meters uh, away from where we do the broadcast from. And for me, it's very important, at least once, to swim out there and just be be on that sort of patch. It's about the size of um, sort of eight ping pong tables stuck together. And then these elk corn corals, sort of several meters high, and there's just these all these fish and that sort of like thrive around there. So it's sort of on a corner, so it gets a nice current coming past it. So with with they would like to hang out there and, and catch a passing a passing sort of morsel, uh, but it gives you that sense of this 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 magic world that that will have existed just decades ago, um, all along the coast of the Caribbean. Uh, so I mean I think we we, we leave it is is that this amazing tiny animal, the coral polyp, created these wonderful three D cities, underwater cities, these worlds that support a quarter of all marine life. And over the course of this week, we'll be exploring various aspects of them, all from the life cycles, the food webs, the threats, the sharks, everything else. They are important, they are wonderful, they're fragile, they're beautiful. And so join us on this journey over the next uh, week or so as we explore the amazing coral reef. And as we end this call, a big thank you again to the National Marine Aquarium. If you have enjoyed this backdrop of their wonderful Great Barrier Reef exhibit, uh, do consider joining one of their virtual tours to see some of the other ocean wonders on offer here or after lockdown ends, come for a visit. And we'll leave you with just a preview of some of their digital learning offer. Until tomorrow, it's been fantastic having you with Coral Live. So goodbye for now. Bye-bye.